Soberdorf here with a very special Christmas design documentary. Christmas is the spirit of giving, and I figure what better way to give than create Subscriber Appreciation Month. So on this Christmas day, I hope so you enjoy- you're not going to get this out on Christmas. What do you mean? It's the holidays, you're already a week behind, there was a steam sale, and now you have a Rocket League addiction. Hey, I can quit Rocket League any time. Telling you, you're not going to make it. Don't worry, I'm going to get this out before Christmas. Legend of Legaia. If you wanted to know what RPGs were like in a post Final Fantasy VII world, Legaia would be a perfect thermometer of the climate. It was a game that promised to change how we would be playing role playing games and seeking to prove that you didn't need to have that Squaresoft logo in order to sell millions of copies, but ended up drowning in a flood of other RPGs that were attempting to do the exact same thing. There was always a push for the RPG genre, but early attempts were met with marginal success at best. It only started to gain momentum with games like Chrono Trigger and Super Mario RPG. Like it or hate it, it wasn't until Final Fantasy VII's massive ad campaign that finally brought the genre to the mainstream market. Then almost overnight, what was once a barren earth became incredibly fertile soil. And Sony, in heavy competition with Nintendo's 64-bit console, was doing everything it possibly could to cultivate that environment. But it wasn't just their sudden popularity that made them so enticing for developers. In an era where fully 3D games were just starting to become a thing, role-playing games were a convenient shortcut for many who weren't quite comfortable with trying to create fully rendered 3D worlds. You didn't require a team of experienced programmers to fine-tune physics engines and hitboxes. You can easily pad the experience to upwards of 80 hours, in an era where length was a major consideration for many consumers. It was their simplicity that made them attractive options for big and small developers alike. But with the release of so many RPGs in such a short time frame, it became difficult to stand out. We have a few that were able to carve a name for themselves, like Suikoden and Star Ocean, but there are many, like Caldeca and Vandal Hearts, that were lost among the crowd. It's similar to the flood of modern military shooters after the release of Call of Duty Modern Warfare. It's hard to make much noise when you're surrounded by explosions. Going back to Legend of Legaia. In a culture of ports, HD remakes, and reboots, Legaia hasn't had the resurgence of popularity that's other RPG brethren have had. That's not to say it doesn't have its fans, but it seems that time has mostly forgotten about this game. But did it deserve to be forgotten? Or was it just a game that simply came in at the wrong place at the wrong time, lost among all the other RPGs in its path? What if I told you the answer was yes? I would say good job because now everyone hates you. Oh crap. Legend of Legaia was developed by Contrail and was released in North America on March 17th, 1999. Described as a cross between Xenogears and Wild Arms with a dash of Silent Hill, Legend of Legaia was published by Sony and given what seems to be an adequate marketing budget. Yet, despite its bold claims of changing how RPGs would play, it met with the resounding meh. It wasn't great, but it wasn't bad either. It was average. Playable. It was, yeah, I played plenty of RPGs and 
Lagaya is definitely an RPG. Which was probably the biggest insult you can give a game that tried so hard to change the mold. The one thing that was heavily boasted was Lagaya's tactical art system. Opposed to the traditional affair of simply selecting your attack from a menu, combat in Lagaya was meant to be more involved. He had the option of attacking your enemy high or low, or with your left or right hand. Certain enemies you would have to strike with a high attack, like if they were flying, or maybe they had a shield so you need to hit their more exposed side. This was meant to make combat far more strategic, making you have to plan out your attacks against enemies, rather than simply pressing X until you want. But the real meat of the combat was the arts. N no, no, not, not those arts. If you entered a certain combination, your character would do a special move that did a little bit more damage. And you could often chain these attacks for a really awesome looking combo that did a lot more damage. These special moves cost art points, a resource that is filled by normally attacking, taking damage, or defending. Though Xenogears had a similar system that predated Lagaya by 9 months, Legend of Lagaya had the advantage of actually being finished. But really, the execution was different enough and novel enough to still be an enjoyable change of pace. The game also featured a unique magic system. Instead of traditionally learning spells as they level, characters instead learn spells off of defeated enemies, similar to blue magic found in Final Fantasy. As you use these spells though, they level up and become more powerful often gaining effects like lowering an enemy's attack stat or healing different status effects as well. All of this sounds like it would have been the evolution of RPG combat, but the actual implementation never feels like it has a lot of depth. The strategy of picking your attacks never really feels important, the arts never push you far beyond using your most powerful combo, and the lack of a more prominent elemental weakness system means that you only pick a handful of spells and leave the rest to atrophy. The end result is a game that has a combat system that by all means is more interesting than it has any right to be, but never feels as satisfying as it should. It's the agency that Lagaya seems to struggle with. Turn-based strategy is almost always about solving a problem, typically an enemy that wants to kill you, with the tools you have which is the variety of attacks at your disposal. Agency comes from how important the player's input matters in choosing the tools. If every option has an equal chance of succeeding, then you're telling the player that the choice doesn't matter. And if there's only one solution to a problem, or if there's a single tool that works in any given situation, then agency doesn't really matter because you aren't really giving the player a choice. Many other games tried to give the player agency in different ways. Most used the simple rock-paper-scissors style of element weaknesses. Other games use some sort of class system where you have to balance the strength and weaknesses of your party members. Games like Final Fantasy used the active time battle system which gave the players a sense of urgency in their decisions. Action commands, positioning, even Undertale's diplomacy system. When any of these things are used correctly, it gives the player agency and makes it feel like their decisions have weight and that the player's input is making an impact. Legend of Lagaya gives you the illusion that you're doing more than you're actually accomplishing. For the majority of the game, you're simply using the same attacks against similar enemies with the best equipment you can afford. Combat involves managing your art points to do your most powerful combo while keeping your hit points from hitting zero. Despite Lagaya's attempts at redefining RPG combat, it ends up being exactly what it rallied against. Most of the strategy involves knowing when to defend, heal, and attack. But instead of simply selecting your attack, you are now pressing right, down, left, up, left, up, right, the lack of strategic options only exacerbates the difficulty of combat. Enemies seem to hit you for what seems like half of your maximum health. Healing items and new equipment are very expensive. The bosses are often so difficult, it can feel like you're hitting a brick wall at the end of every dungeon. And it's difficult and tedious just to simply grind levels in order to overcome the game's challenges. 
And it's the game's difficulty that makes you realize how few options you really have. That's not to say Ligaia's combat system is bad. The game definitely stands better with its tactical art system than without it. It's just disappointing to see such an interesting and innovative concept not live up to its full potential. But let's be fair, Legend of Ligaia was still doing far more than others of its ilk, and it might be just a flaw in what can be considered an underrated gem. What could possibly be more important to the legacy of Legend of Ligaia is the tale it tries to tell. So what's the story behind Ligaia anyway? Stop me if you heard this one before. You are Vaughn, our 14 year old silent protagonist who has just reached his coming of age ceremony and is ready to live his life in the peaceful village of Rimelm. But that very night, an evil mage named Zeto seeks to destroy your village and the Genesis tree which has protected your town from the evil mist. <sighs> so, you go to the Genesis tree and you find out you are the chosen one meant to save the world. With the power of the tree, you defeat the evil creatures and save your village. But you know, you must travel to the world and awaken... Um, Awaken the other trees before, before the evil. Uh. Hey, sober. I honestly wish I was clever enough to be this hyperbolic, but this is the actual plot of the game for your first hour. Legend of Ligaia doesn't just copy the monomyth, but it fails to remove the hyperlinks and the citations from the text. That by itself isn't a crime, but Ligaia handles the execution so poorly that it almost comes across as parody. It doesn't establish a theme, it never takes the time to set a tone. It doesn't avert any tropes. The characters mostly have one defining personality trait. The dialogue is completely expositionary, and it spoils so much of its own mystery through its usage of cliches and poor reveals. Compare that to the opening of Final Fantasy VII. God, you're which, such a fanboy. You're always talking about Final Fantasy VII. You first brought it up in your Bushido Blade video, then you brought it up in both of your Mystic Quest videos, then you even wore that shirt in your Nobunaga's video. When are you going to shut up about that game? There have been other RPGs other than Final Fantasy VII, Sober. I am tired of your pro Final Fantasy VII agenda on my internet. Um, uh, compare that to the opening of Ligaia's closer contemporary, Xenogears, which opens up with a very dramatic scene of a destruction of a spaceship, cryptic religious imagery, a naked woman with unreasonably long hair, and mechs that know kung fu. At first, the game explains to you absolutely nothing, and it won't be explained until well after you've forgotten about it. And that is amazing storytelling. Xenogears immediately draws you in because you want to know more about what's going on. As such, the actual opening, which is very similar to Ligaia's, becomes much more interesting because you're paying attention, and they take full advantage of it as you learn about the main character and his backstory. Legend of Ligaia does very little to actually make you care about the narrative initially. It just makes this assumption that you should automatically be invested. And it's such a shame because despite all that, Ligaia does an excellent job at building the world. It's almost completely disproportionate to the story it tries to tell. The game essentially takes place in a post-apocalyptic setting. The mist has forced humanity into small pockets where the mist can't pervade, and it causes these symbiotic creatures known as the Seru to become mad. 
The Gaia does such an excellent job at showing you how the mist has affected the world. From the pain of the people of Jeremy as they deal with the revelation that they might have killed their own family while possessed by the Seru. To Gaza, the warrior so consumed with hatred for the Seru killing his family that it causes him not to want the Genesis tree revived just so he has more Seru to kill. So there were many times in La Gaia where I didn't care about reviving the Genesis trees and saving the world. I was more interested in going into the next town just to see how they were affected by the mist. That's not to say that the narrative in La Gaia is bad. It attempts to tell a story in such a way that no other RPG was doing at the time. It touches on themes such as human sacrifice and mercy killing. The fact that the game still keeps its tone and presentation consistent would normally make it feel disjointed or forced in but instead it comes across as poignant and subtle. You don't really think about the gravity of the situation until you wake up in the middle of the night needing a drink from the fridge when it finally hits you just how mature the story really is. The problem though is that like Gaia takes its sweet time before it gets to that point. The first time you uncover a plot arc that seems interesting is around 10 hours into the game. Well after anyone who is a bit more selective would have already checked out. The fact that Ligaya can make you feel invested after such a slow start is a testament to how good the game's storytelling can be. But it's entirely reasonable that you don't want to have to dig that deep to get a great experience. Especially during a time when there are so many other options available to you in the genre. And here's where we start to see the reason why Ligaya might have been overlooked for its time. It's a game that promised the world with its combat mechanics, its story, and its presentation. However, it just takes too long for the average player to get to that point. In a world where weekend rentals and demo disc is what sold your game, Ligaya came across as nothing more than a run-of-the-mill RPG. Because despite all these flaws, Ligaya did so many things right. I cannot praise the small innovations it took enough. In combat alone, models are large, detailed, and very fluid in their movement. The arts look amazing, especially when they're chained together. Armor and weapons you equip change how your character looks. Even small touches such as your character's victory animation changing depending on how much damage you've taken or how enemies will fall down after a particularly devastating combo. You can tell a lot of thought and love was put into this game. And that's not even including all the other content the game offers. Also, another thing to remember, Ligaya was one of the first fully 3D RPGs in history. Many RPGs before had used 2D sprites or 3D models on pre-rendered backgrounds. But almost every asset in Ligaya is a 3D model. This allowed Ligaya to change camera angles for sweeping shots and a more cinematic approach making it come across more like a movie than a stage play. While now it's easily overlooked, it was incredibly impressive back in 1999. In the end, Legend of Ligaya was a game that had a lot of really strong concepts, but misguided implementation. Game design isn't just about having a lot of great ideas, it's more about how well they work together. Ligaya is by no means a bad game, but the timing it's just a little bit off. That's not to say if they managed to do everything perfectly it would have been a Squaresoft killer, but maybe in some alternate universe we'd be talking about Ligaya 5 on the PlayStation 4. But even today Ligaya still has its own place in history and has definitely found its niche among gamers who enjoyed the neat combat and difficult nature of the game. It sold nearly a million copies worldwide and featured a re-release in Japan in the same month when its sequel, Ligaya 2 Duel Saga, released in 2001. So while Ligaya didn't break any records, it was by no means a commercial failure for Contrail or Sony. Speaking of which, what exactly happened to Contrail? Well, it seems that after releasing Ligaya's sequel, they ended up fading into the shadows. 
Some basic research suggests that Sony end up assimilating the company among its own game development studio. However, you might know the works of Contrail, or at least its former president, Takahiro Kaneko. This man was involved with the production of games such as Elemental Gearbolt, Rogue Galaxy, and the esteemed Demon Souls, as well as served as the supervisor in Tokyo Jungle, played a part in the promotion of Rule of Rose, served as the sales planner for Shadow of the Colossus, and even received special thanks in Bloodborne. And though I haven't found any evidence of it, I have a strong suspicion that Mr. Kaneko was involved with the development of Team Fortress 2, judging by how many hats the man wears. Actually, I can't be mad. That was pretty good. Legend of the Gaia was probably not the masterpiece that Sony was hoping for, but it didn't have to be. The Gaia's contribution was more about what it meant to be an RPG and what you could offer. It didn't change the vernacular of role-playing games, but it offered a few more ideas to the conversation. It's a game that, in the grand scheme of things, is perfectly fine not having that experience with. But it's also an underrated gem for those of you who are digging for treasure. Unfortunately, without a PlayStation Network release, and physical copies demanding more and more, there isn't more opportunity for people to experience it for themselves. It's unfortunate there is no simple way for people to make their own judgments about Legend of Ligaya. <coughs> Emulation! <coughs> but instead of lamenting the experiences we didn't get to have, the New Year's is a good opportunity to find and explore the experiences that are about to arrive. Also, I want to thank everyone watching for the support they've given me this year. Without you, these videos wouldn't be made. So, even though Subscriber Appreciation Month might be over, know that I appreciate you all year long. This experience, you could say, helped me build character. This is Soberdorf, thanks for watching. Hey, real quick before I get into a game of Rocket League. I wanted to say thank you for anyone who has taken the time to subscribe. I'm almost at 100 subs and that means I'll have a real YouTube URL. That's a huge milestone for me and I appreciate anyone who helped get me there. If you're interested in more PlayStation goodness, you can check out the very first video I've done on Bushido Blade. But if you're craving some more RPGs, then I did a video on Final Fantasy Mystic Quest you can check out. Alright, now time to drive some cars into balls.